Okay, so let, let me um, go through the, 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 the second uh, problem I wanted to talk about, which was um, uh, how you count the number of triangles in a, um, in a graph. Um, the application I've mentioned before is, is, is up here, that um, it's, the density of triangles has been used to measure the age or maturity of communities on the theory that as a community ages, more and more of its members uh, tend to connect, and therefore the density of triangles grows up. But uh, what I want to talk to you about actually turns out to be a special case of a very recent theory um, of how you do optimal joins of, of all types. Uh, interestingly, I mean, you know, companies like Oracle have been uh, selling uh, database systems for now, I don't know, three decades. And it was only like two years ago that people discovered the optimal algorithm for joins. Uh, uh, Oracle's algorithm uh, was, was never uh, and still isn't optimal in the sense that there are cases where it, it, just, it, it, it just takes orders of magnitude more time than the best algorithm uh, for, for that, that job. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm going to assume that I have n nodes and m edges. Uh, m will be at least n, and at most, uh, can, obviously, can't be more than n squared. Actually, can't be more than half n squared. Uh, um, so one thing I could do to count the triangles is I could just go, go through all triples of nodes. That would be n cubed nodes, or well, n cubed over 6, because I just want sets of, sets of three nodes, uh, and see if there are edges connecting them in all possible ways. And so there's a triangle uh, involving those three nodes, and that's an order n cubed algorithm. Um, a, a slightly better approach is to consider each edge, each of the m edges, and then in connection, consider all nodes other than the two endpoints of that edge. So that's order n different nodes. And see if that node, if the node u, has connections to both ends of E. Now, if I've set up the right data structures, I can answer those questions in order one time each. So this gives me an order m times n algorithm. That can't be worse, that can't be worse and could be better than the consider all three, uh, all sets of three nodes, because again, m can't be bigger than n squared. <coughs> well, th again, the key to, um, to all of these optimal join algorithms is making a distinction between uh, heavy hitter values and those that are not. In, the, in this situation, a heavy hitter will be, is, is a node whose degree, that is number of edges coming in, uh, is, uh, is at least the square root of the number of edges. Okay. Um, and now, the, 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 the key observation is if I've, if I've defined heavy hitter that way, there can't be more than two square root of m heavy hitters. Right? Because uh, each heavy hitter it has degree at least square root of m, so the total degrees of all the heavy hitters will be 2m. Well, that's the total number, of, that's the total degree of all the nodes in the graph because each edge, each of the m edges, contributes 2 to the degree, 1 for each of its ends. Okay, so the, the, the number of heavy hitters has to be relatively small. So, uh, a, let's call a triangle a heavy hitter triangle if all three of its nodes are heavy hitters. Okay, so uh, I can find the heavy hitter triangles in relatively uh, little time. First, well, first of all, I have to figure out which the heavy hitters are. That doesn't take much, uh, much time at all uh, in comparison with, with, with this job. Uh, again, since there are only order square root of m heavy hitters, the number of triples of heavy hitters is the most uh, order m to the 1.5, 
And so I can, I can look at all the triples of, of heavy hitters, check whether the three edges exist, and I can therefore find all the heavy hitter triangles in time uh, order m to the uh, three halves. Okay, now any other triangle has to have at least one node that isn't a heavy hitter. So I'm going to find those as follows. I'm going to look at each edge E. And if both ends are heavy hitters, I'm going to just ignore it. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to look at the ends that are not heavy hitters. Now, the nice thing about a non-heavy hitter is it doesn't have too many adjacent nodes. Right? So let's suppose that, that node U is, is the, one of the ends of this edge E, and it's not a heavy hitter. Then it takes me time at most square root of m, again, assuming I have the right data structures, uh, to look at the nodes that are uh, adjacent to u. And for each of those nodes v, I just want to check, is it connected to the other end of e? So for each edge, it takes me time, square root of m at most, to check, to find all the triangles in which that edge can be uh, can be oh, sorry, all the non-heavy hitter triangles in which that edge can be found. Okay, so that's another m to the 1.5, right? Because there are m edges at most. Well, some some have both have two heavy hitter ends, but they can't be more than m edges that I have to look at. It takes me order of square root of m time to figure out what triangles that edge can be part of. Uh, and so that's m to the 1.5 again. So why do we ignore the cases where both ends are heavy hitters? Because we've already got all the heavy hitter triangles. No, but maybe the third node is not a heavy hitter. Well, then we'll catch that when we consider one of the other edges. Right? If, 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 if a triangle has at least one node that isn't a heavy hitter, then it's got at least two of its three edges that have non-heavy hitter ends. And so we're going we're gonna to catch that one. Maybe you can also comment what kind of graphs you have in mind, because square root of m degree is quite large, say, so consider social graphs, or like Facebook square root it's, of m. It's degree. quite, yes, but, but it, uh, again, think of Facebook. N, n is a billion, m is 300 billion. Yeah. So, um, well, nodes times edges is, what, three times... Three times ten to the twentieth. Okay, uh, that's a big number. Uh, square root of m is going to be uh, about what? Uh, let, let's call it a million. Yeah, but usually Facebook friends are like you know, hundreds, thousands, so like millions. Uh, I mean, call um, call call square root of m. Uh, I don't know, five times. Wait a minute. Uh, Five, five, five times ten to the fifth, five, 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 about half a million. So somehow, I, I, I mean, sort of, I have an impression of a sparse graph where the degree is sort of a log of maybe m or n, but square root of m is so large. Well, square, but, square, but the square root of m will be pretty small compared with n. It's about half a million versus a billion in the case of Facebook. So, yeah, but then we require to be to have such nodes with such degree. While in Facebook, we wouldn't find any. No, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I mean, you, you're right. There, um, if again, if m is three hundred billion, then square root of m is about half a million. And you're right. There are pro. Well, I don't know. Maybe um, uh, Narendra Modi has half a million friends on Facebook. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly has more than that. Twitter, Twitter. Well, sure, right, exactly. Certainly has more Twitter. than that number. On, in Twitter, you do get these millions of followers. So you do get, you could get heavy hitter triangles. Yeah. But, but uh, again, don't, don't worry about that because you probably don't want to do this for the entire Facebook graph. Because remember, what are you asking? You're asking is Facebook a mature community or not? Who cares? 
Right. You know, but, it, but, but the way it has been used is, you know, you look at a community that was formed six months ago, so has it peaked or is it still growing? And the way you look at that is by counting the triangles within a community of a couple of thousand people. Uh, uh, okay. Um, okay, anyway, so the bottom line is if you, if you break your problem into these two cases, the heavy hitter triangles and the non-heavy hitter triangles, you can find each of those in edges to the 1.5. And again, that's compared with you know, edges with m times n versus m to the 1.5, you're really comparing n with square root of m. And it, since social network graphs do tend to be fairly sparse, you know, if, if the average degree of a billion node graph is 300, it's a really sparse graph. So square root of m is really much less than n. Uh, so, so this is a big, uh, is actually a big deal. Uh, you know, again, admittedly, whether something takes time, the time, ten to the twentieth or ten to the eighteenth, really doesn't matter because you can't do it anyway. Right? But, but when it's you know a couple of orders of magnitude less, th this issue does become important. Um, uh, okay, well, any, anyway, I'm not just going to claim that it's, it's optimal. It turns out that for more or less any n and m, uh, uh, you can always find a graph that has n nodes and m edges and actually has as many as m to the 1.5 triangles. You presumably can't count the triangles without actually finding each one, so you, you can't do any better than... Uh, than, than m to the 1.5, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, okay, and, and I, I think I've, I've said this before. If you think about m, yeah. and since m can't be bigger than n squared and is usually a lot less than n, than n, uh, than n squared, uh, m to the 1.5 is, is significantly less than both n, than n cubed and even m times n. Okay. Uh, so, so again, the last topic I want to talk about is this matter of neighborhoods. Um, and, okay, the, the notion of neighborhoods, uh, I assume everybody's familiar with the idea, if two nodes are adjacent in the sense that they have an edge between them, then they're neighbors. And the neighborhood at distance, some distance d from a node u is the set of nodes v such that there is a path of length at most d from u to v. Um, and I'm going uh, I'm going to call that uh, okay I'll use the notion of n of u and d is the set of nodes at distance up to d from uh, from you um, now uh, at some okay you can think of the sequence of neighborhood sizes n of u and 0 is just 1, because only u is at distance 0 from itself. Uh, n of u and 1 is the number of, of neighbors that u has. Uh, n of u and 2 is the, no, the union of the neighbors at uh, distance 1 of all of the uh, neighbors of, of u, uh, 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 all of the neighbors of u, uh, and so on. Once you get up to uh, distance n minus 1, no node can be more than distance n minus 1 if there are n nodes in the graph from any other node, so that at some point the sequence con converges. It has to be a connected graph. No. My, I didn't say that it's going to be all, it's going to, well, it's going to, you know, n of, n of u and capital N minus 1 will always be all the nodes that are reachable from u. That may be all the nodes if it's connected, or it may be a subset, Maybe just its its connected component, but uh, but the point is it's surely going to converge at some point. Uh, so here's here's our, the graph we were talking about just just a while ago. Uh, let's see. So uh, node E again, uh, neighborhood of at distance zero is just E itself. Neighborhood at distance one you get D and F as well. At distance two you get G and B. 
And by the time you get to distance three, you've got all, all the, the neighborhood is the entire graph. Okay. Not very deep. Okay. Again, um, motivation um, here is, is, as I said, if, if you want to decide who to give an iPad to, you give it to somebody who has a large neighborhood of, of some small distance. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter exactly who the members of that neighborhood are. You just want to know the size of the neighborhood. So what I'm really going to talk about is, is computing the size of your neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood of each node at various distances. Uh, well, in principle, there's a very simple recurrence, right? Um, the, na the neighborhood of u at distance zero is just u. And the neighborhood for node new, u at distance d is the union of the neighborhood of v at distance d minus one over all neighbors v of u. Okay. Now, you know, it's conceptually simple, but if you have a billion nodes, do you really want to try to compute these unions for all the nodes in the graph? Okay, again, they tend to be fairly big, right? Because if, if you have 300, if everybody has 300 neighbors, uh, you know, well, they don't have 90,000 neighbors at distance two, but it's probably in the tens of thousands, so it depends on how many duplicates, how many of your neighbors have neighbors in common. You, you don't know. So, so you got a lot of work to do. You're dealing with unions of very big sets very quickly. Um, uh, and, and so if all we want to do is count them, count, count these neighborhoods, I, I say they, you, there's got to be a better way to do it. Okay, well, again, if you want an exact count, no, you have to maintain those sets exactly and compute the unions exactly. Um, but if all you want is a count, you can actually use the Flagellet-Martin algorithm in a, in a different way, and it has nothing to do with, with streams. Uh, to, uh, to, 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 to get a, a, an estimate of the sizes of the neighborhoods at various distances. And so I'm just going to set up the, the recurrence. Uh, I, I'll let you sort of figure out the, the, the details. Um, OK, so what, again, what I want to do, what, 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 you can use, what you're really using Flagellet Martin for uh, is to estimate the size of the union of several sets. Now remember, the sets are going to be represented by these, the tail lengths of, of hash values of, of the nodes in the set. And, in, well, I don't know, okay, so first of all, we'll have several hash functions, say 100 hash functions, because we, we want a good estimate, so we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to keep, let's say, 100 or 200 or 300 variables. Um, but I'm just going to explain to you how one of them works, or what you do with one of these hash functions, and it should then be obvious how you would run this for, let's say, a hundred different hash functions, and how you would combine the estimates of sizes. Uh, again, you compute that, that the capital R, where two to the capital R is, is the estimate. Uh, it says two to the, the maximum tail length. Of, of you know zeros in that uh, in the hash function, uh, two to the maximum tail length is is the estimate of the neighborhood size that any one hash function gives you. You combine those uh, using uh, averages of small groups and then median of of all the groups to get the true estimate. And and the more hash functions you use, the closer you're going to be. Okay, so again, the the, again, the idea is again for for the one hash function h to to get an estimate of the size of the neighborhood of some node u 
using uh, dis uh, at distance d is you want to compute, you're going to compute the maximum tail length, that is the maximum number of, of zeros at the end of the hash value, among all the nodes in that neighborhood. See, and, and then, then again, the, 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 the nice thing about the Flagellate Martin idea is if a node appears, if you're taking the union of, of, I don't know, 300 neighborhoods, and a node appears in 10 of them, its tail length only counts once because you're just looking for the maximum. Okay, um, so so you don't you don't have to worry about how many you know eliminating duplicates. You really are e each member of one or more of those neighborhoods contributes its tail length toward uh, computing the maximum, and it, it's. You know, it's exactly like uh, in the, the stream case where it doesn't matter how many times the same element appears in the stream because it's always contributing the same tail to this process of finding the maximum. Okay. What, what do you actually hash? Hash for each node? Or um, yeah, the node has a name or a number or something you're going to hash. You, you'll hash it. Um, Okay, so, uh, all right, well, we said this. The, the, can the, the maximum tail length, which we called capital R, uh, we're going to use 2 to the R as the, the estimate of the, of the size of a set that comes from, again, this 1 out of, say, 100 hash function. Mm -hmm. um, now, the recurrent, and this, this is, again, this is really all you need to know, and that's all, I think this is really the last slide, this is all you need to know to handle one hash function, get the max, the tail length, the, the capital R that's associated with any neighborhood of any any node, any distance. And again, if you want an estimate, you then have to you, you just in the same old way we did Flagellate Martin, you'll combine those estimates uh, to get your best guess at the actual size of the neighborhood. So, and the point is, okay, so n, the neighborhood of node u and distance d is the union of the neighbors, uh, you, go, you take the union over all neighbors of u, say v, of that neighborhood of distance d minus 1. And again, there'll be a lot of duplications within these neighborhoods, it doesn't matter. Uh, because it, all, all you want is the capital R value associated with the neighborhood of u and distance d. And that's the largest of, well, first of all, the tail, tail length of h of u itself. Because that sometimes u will, it will just be the maximum. And then, you, you, t then you, you also compare that and take the largest of tail length of h of u and the maximum tail length associated with any of the neighborhoods of distance d minus 1 uh, for any of the neighbors of u. And that's actually all there is to it. Okay. So I, I, think, I think that's the last, of, last thing I wanted to say about neighborhood counting. Okay, well, okay, that's not. Uh, well, as I said, that, that, again, that gives you the recurrence, that gets you r for any hash function, uh, you combine the hash functions in the in the usual way, and I think that's the end. Okay. So how do you get to the average? Wait, wait, I'm sorry. sorry. How do you combine get to the average of different hash functions? Well, remember, remember, we, we talked about this when we talked about uh, Flagellate Martin. You say you you've got let's say 100 hash functions. You put them into groups of of size. Uh, um, uh, log n, where n is, is, is sort of the, in this case would be the number of nodes. Um, and uh, you take the average within a group, and then you take the median of the averages. And, and that, that, that certainly, remember, there, there are two things that, that you have to worry about. One is, uh, uh, you, you, you need to take me, you need to have medians in there so that outlying large values won't influence the result. And you also want to make, you, you, you can't be too discrete, since 2 to the r is always a power of 2, 
you, you, you have to take an average of enough elements that you at least have a chance of getting any integer value, right? Or otherwise, you're gonna, you're gonna have, there's gonna be, it's gonna be impossible to converge to the actual number just because it's, uh, because it's impossible to get certain numbers as sum of small numbers of powers of two. Okay. Uh, probably you don't need that precise count anyway. Um, the, well, yeah, it's, it's an estimate, but... Because in Facebook, I think if you do uh, distance four or five, it's all. Yeah. If you do distance one, it's just your neighbor, so probably what you need is only two or three, which is... Uh, well, any of the rough estimates. Okay. I'm sorry, any, any other questions on, on the, the three algorithms that I talked about? Okay. Well, what, what I'd like to do next then is um, talk about actually, my, th this is my own little baby here. Um, and um, what I and some other people uh, have been trying to do over the past couple of years is to understand the design of MapReduce algorithms. Okay. Um, and the, the thing that is, is, is sort of hard to get at, but which is true, is that MapReduce algorithms are not just parallel algorithms in general. There's there's an element of the theory which we call mapping schemas, and I'm going to, to I'll define what that is. Uh, that is an, it's an essential part of, of, it's an essential constraint on how good a MapReduce algorithm can be. Um, and, and, and in fact, I'll, 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 I'll tell you where the, where the problem comes in. It's that any output that is produced by a MapReduce algorithm has to come from some one reducer. And one reducer can only have some inputs. And so if I'm going to produce all the outputs that my problem requires me to produce, I have to arrange that for every output, the set of inputs it needs lives together at one reducer. And that's you know, it's, in, it, it's not necessary in other, you know, other models like PRAM models uh, of, of, of parallelism. Um, so, now I assume everybody here has uh, had their fill of MapReduce and how it works. Okay, so, so I've, got, I've got some notes that I'm going to just go over very, very quickly to, to just get everybody on board the terminology. Then I want to talk about a particular problem called all pairs and how it, well, um, how easy it is to make a mistake in the design of, of, the, of, an, algor of an algorithm for a very simple problem. Uh, and then I will, I'll present the theory and then um, some extensions that I've actually been working on with my son recently. My, 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 my son has become a theoretical computer scientist. Dad told him this is, a, I mean, I told him this is a mistake. I mean, I was able to get away with this 40 years ago because nobody knew what they were doing. And you can't do that anymore. Uh, but he's, kids just don't listen to their. <laughs> anyway, but I, so I'll tell you what, what, what uh, John, my son Jonathan and I have been doing at, at, the, at the end. Anyway, so, so here's, okay. You know this, okay? Why, why, do you, why would you use MapReduce? Parallel programming becomes really easy. Uh, you don't have to worry about hardware and software failures. Uh, you don't have to worry about the scale of your data too much. Um, okay, so, okay, as far as I'm concerned, a MapReduce job, you have a collection of inputs of a single type. Uh, you apply to the element, the inputs, a map function. The map function takes a single input, does something, uh, produces key-value pairs, um, and I want to use the term a mapper to mean the application of the map function to one input. That's probably not a standard. Sta it's not standard terminology. I, I, I realize that, uh, but often people talk about a map task as being a collection of, of what I call mappers. Um, 
Okay, then it's so the output of a map function will be a set of key value pairs. It can be zero, it can be one, it can be any large number of key value pairs that come out of a single mapper. Um, then behind the scenes, there's some magic going on and you, you turn a collection of key value pairs into a key with all of its associated values. And then there's a reduce function that takes a key and the list of values and uh, produces some set of outputs. Uh, and again, I, I, I want to call a, a reducer is the application of the reduce function to a single key and all of its values. And a, a you know, reduce task would be several redu collection of reducers. Okay, and then as the output is the union of what the reducers produce. Okay, and and again, this is the this is the special thing about that reduce algorithms is every output is produced by one reducer in particular. Okay, the picture again. I assume everybody is familiar with this. You, the inputs come in to the mappers. Uh, the mappers will produce some key value pairs. Uh, they get shipped to various reducers, and the reducers then produce the outputs, blah, 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 blah. Okay, word count, I assume, has, has somebody covered word count, the word count algorithm? Yeah, okay. All right, so we, we, know, we know how that works. Okay, blah, 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 that, that's my code. Um, and you know this, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, maybe this is not uh, completely obvious, but there's, there's a property of MapReduce and of certain other systems, I guess, including things like Spark or Flink, uh, that, um, that is the blocking property, which is you can't use the output of a task until the task is complete. And that's what lets you, uh, again, MapReduce is not unique in having this property by any means, but it is a key property that all of these useful systems have, is that if a task fails for some reason before it's finished, you don't have to worry about whether somebody's con consumed part of its output or not. Okay. And, and, and I, think, I think this is important. It's the thing that lets you restart a task rather than restart an, an entire job. Okay. Anyway. Okay, what are the costs associated with a MapReduce algorithm? Well, obviously, the execution time of each, the sum of times of the, uh, that each mapper and each reducer takes, that's, that's computation time. It's presumably distributed in some, uh, over some large number of parallel uh, 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 tasks executing in parallel. And then there's communication cost of transmitting the output of the mappers to the location of the reducer that needs it. Um, and I'm going, going to assume that we're really trying to get some parallelism out of this, uh, the, this job. So the chances that a, a mapper will run at the same compute node that a reducer runs, that the, that the reducer that needs it uh, also runs, is, is I'm just going to assume it's zero. So every thing has to be communicated across the network. And actually, even if that's not true, it still is going to wind up on disk. Okay. And of, often it's been more expensive to, to put something onto disk and take it out again than it is to just ship it over a network. But, um, but anyway, anyway, so the, the point is the, the communication cost, in, I'm going to assume, is the number of things that have to be communicated from mappers to reducers. Uh, and there are lots of applications, obviously not every application you could imagine, but, but in many cases, the communication cost is what dominates. Okay, so I'm really going to focus on communication cost. Uh, computation cost, typically you can't control anyway. The, the only thing you can do is, is spread it over more and more machines so that it gets done in less wall clock time, but it's, uh, you're going to total cycles you, you really can't control anyway. Okay, so anyway, as I said, I, I want to talk about um, this this problem called all pairs, um, and 
it, 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 it actually came up in a project that I was supervising in our, in our, co in our course, where um, the students, you know, they learned about MapReduce in the, in the course. They had, they had a, a, a good problem of, of finding drug interactions. Uh, and so they went off and they did an algorithm using MapReduce. And the midterm uh, reports were due that day. And the job was running and running and running. And it was due and nothing was happening. And they, they, uh, they got in touch with me and we, we talked about what they were doing. And it turned out they were making a, doing a very natural thing which turned out to be a disaster and had an easy fix. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. Uh, okay, first, so, so first of all, as I said, this, we have this, this data mining project course where students propose their own projects. Uh, we give them some data if they want to use it. Many of them find data from other sources. In this case, uh, they were actually using data that came out of the Stanford Hospital. Uh, where they had uh, information about tracing about a million patients over 20 years, um, what uh, diagnoses had been made, what medications they'd been given. And um, they wanted to find, uh, uh, well, their initial proposal was they wanted to find triples of drugs that caused any sort of bad reaction whatsoever. Uh, once we, we, yeah, yeah, uh, and once once we sort of looked at the scale of the problem, we, we sort of focused on two drugs that cause a heart attack. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you were very optimistic. Okay. It wasn't me. It was their proposal? You know, we, you know, we let we let them do that. We figured that you know if they learn what they can't do. Well, we've done our job. And anyway, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. The point is, they had records for about 3,000 drugs that were administered frequently enough that you might make some statistically significant uh, observations about them. Again, they knew exactly what patients had taken them, when, what diagnoses were made when. And the whole thing, on average, was about a megabyte of data per drug. And, and, then, and then, so they had to extract from the, the actual database. They, ex they extracted this, say, a megabyte per drug. And obviously, it was much more for some drugs that were very commonly used and, and less for those that were, uh, were uncommon. But average was about a megabyte. OK, and then as I said, the problem they focused on was uh, which pairs of drugs cause um, uh, caused the, the risk of a heart attack to go up. Uh, and, you know, and, and that, that wasn't, um, and even, you know, even, even that's a rather tricky problem. You have, you have to be careful. For example, one of their first discoveries before we had focused on this particular problem was that acne medication prevents heart attacks. Okay. Think about it. Sorry? Acne medication. Oh, okay. Prevents heart attacks. Think think about that. Why is that true? Yeah, because the patients are young. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. No, wasn't, there's no causality. So so you have to normalize for age. Uh, you know, it it it. You know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of tricky things going on, uh, in, in order to, to to make this the data statistically uh, statistically valid. In particular, you have to uh, normalize for age and gender and. and um, Okay, so, um, and, and now by the way, the 3,000 drugs, megabyte per drug, that's three gigabytes of data. Okay, not big data by any means, right? It fits on your laptop, the main, in the main memory of, of your laptop. Okay, but look at what they had to do. They had to con look at each pair of drugs and compare, to really run a chi-square test uh, on on those two, two one megabyte records. And so there, there are 4.5 million pairs of drugs. Um, and so there's actually, there's actually a lot of work. Okay, so 
hey, no problem. We'll just do everything in parallel. Okay, so here's how they designed the MapReduce algorithm. Uh, a key would be a set of two drugs, an unordered, uh, uh, well, order, ordered list of, of, of two drugs. And the value that would be associated would be the record for one of these drugs. Okay, so now what does a mapper do? It takes one drug I with its, its record, uh, a megabyte long record R sub I, and it's going to generate all the key value pairs that contain, where the key contains I, and the value is going to be Ri. Okay, so that, that's what things look like from the point of view of the mapper. Now, from the point of view of the reducer, the reducer for the pair Ij, well, it's going to be generated, uh, it, there'll be two key value pairs with that key generated. One from I, one from J. The one from I will have the record Ri, the other will have the record uh, Rj. So what, uh, so what, from the point of view of the reducer, the key Ij gets a list of two records and just computes the chi-squared, uh, the chi-squared value. And if it's high enough, uh, reports uh, that, um, that, that these are uh, two drugs that produ uh, produce a heart attack. And uh, by the way, uh, there were about 80 known pairs of drugs that, that do cause a heart attack. When they finally got this thing right, I and mean, they did actually did a very good job, they were able to identify 40 of them. And they also identified two more that had very high chi-squared values, but were not known. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I consider that a, 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 a win for science. But, um, but anyway, they did have a little trouble here. So it, it, here's a picture of what goes on, assuming we had three drugs rather than three thousand drugs. So the mapper for drug one, it, it's going to produce one key value pair that has the set one two because it's got to have set. We've got to have drug one and one of the other drugs. So one two is is one of the things. Well, one of the keys, and then it will attach the drug one data. We'll also generate the key one three with that drug one data. And then the mappers for the other two drugs do analogous things. And then the system behind the scenes sorts by key, okay, and then organizes as a key in a list of values. So this is what the reducers actually get to see. And you know, looks simple enough, right? So the reducer, for example, for the pair 1, 2 is going to do a chi-squared test on the drug 1 data and the drug 2 data and see whether that's high enough to say that drugs 1 and 2 should not be administered together unless you really want a heart attack. Okay. Well, everybody see why this doesn't work? It's yeah. spending a lot of data? Yeah. Right, there are 3,000 drugs. I generate 2,999 key value pairs per drug. And each key value pair on the average is a megabyte long. Uh, you multiply that together, you get nine terabytes. Now, it was running on EC2, so you've got these one gigabit ethernet connections. It's a little tricky because there are lots of these one gigabit connections. Um, you know, they're using some number of them in parallel, but on the other hand, there are also other jobs that other people are using that are competing for the same communication uh, uh, lines. So it, it's, it's not clear how long this would, that this would take, but I, I can tell you that they have to have 90,000 seconds of, of, of network use, some of which may be in parallel, but 90,000 seconds is just a little bit over one day, by the way. Okay, and so it's no surprise, after eight hours they killed the job. Okay, okay so, so what do we do about that? Well, um, this is actually a simplification of what, what we, we did, I just, I just used some round numbers to make, the, make it uh, more understandable. Um, well, let's put the drugs into 30 groups of 100 drugs each. OK? 
Okay. So first group uh, is drugs 1 to 100, the second is 101 through 200, and so on. Um, and then I, I, I will always, I always want to use uh, G of I will mean the group that drug I belongs to. Now, here's what, here's what the mapper is going to do. A key is now a set of two group numbers, not a set of two drug numbers. So the mapper for drug I will produce 29 key value pairs where those 29 keys are all the sets consisting of the group that I belongs to and one of the other groups. Okay. And the value is still essentially just the, the record for drug number I, but in this case you also have to attach I to it so that we know who, which drug that record uh, belongs to, uh, because now groups can have more than one, uh, one drug. Now, from the point of view of the reducers, the reducer for a pair of groups, say M and N, is going to get 200 drug records, 100 from group M, 100 from group N, uh, and it needs to compare all the records from group M with all the records from group N. Okay, so it's going to do 10,000 chi-squared tests rather than one. But uh, if you think about it, well, okay, first of all, you also need to compare two drugs that belong to the same group. You don't want 29 different reducers doing that job, so you, you have to have some policy that says uh, who gets to do the intra-group uh, comparisons. It, it doesn't matter how you, there are lots of ways to do it. Uh, I just have one way here. Uh, now, computation, by the way, doesn't change. True, each reducer is doing 10,000 uh, or, or even more if it's also responsible for the intra group comparisons, but doing about 10,000. Uh, chi square tests rather than one, but there are only one, there are one ten thousandth of as many reducers. So every pair of drugs gets compared by exactly one reducer. You're still doing exactly the same computation. Okay. However, the communication is 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 very different. You still have three thousand drugs one megabyte per drug, but now it, instead of replicating it 2,999 times, just 29 times. The communication cost is uh, still large, 87 gigabytes, but um, that's about 100 times less than the 9 terabytes that the uh, first algorithm gave you. And that was, in fact, good enough that they were able to, to get the job run in about an hour. Okay, so let's see. Um, all right, I'm, 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 I'm just. Uh, let, 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 let me just start the theory a little bit. Again, I want to you know, acknowledge uh, my, my, the co-authors on on this theory. It's, it's a photo of Ferrati, uh, Anish Das Sarma, who was a uh, was a recent graduate from our program at Stanford, uh, Semi Salyaglu, who's graduating this year, and and myself. Uh, and there are the two notions. Well, three notions. I want to talk about the reducer size, which is the number of inputs that, that a reducer can take. Uh, the replication rate, which is how many times do you, how many key value pairs do you generate per uh, input. And then this notion of a mapping schema, which is, is really a description of the algorithm. And the theory is going to say, you know, the existence of a mapping schema says that if you want a small reducer size, you need a big replication rate. Okay. Uh, anyway, we'll see how that all works in a second. Okay. So, first of all, again, uh, we have a notion of a problem and a notion of an algorithm. The, algor the, the algorithm is, is what we call the mapping schema. But a problem is simply a set of inputs, say the drug records, set of outputs, which are the things you want. In this case, it would be really just a number for every pair of drugs, which is the chi-squared value. Uh, or even a, you know, a, a bit, one bit saying, is the chi-squared value so high that I believe there's an interaction? Um, 
And then the, pro the, the problem consists of a, a many-to-many -many relationship between inputs and outputs, where each output is related to exactly those inputs that are necessary to compute it. And again, remember, the thing about a MapReduce algorithm is all the inputs for an output have to go to some one reducer. Okay, so in our example case, the output for the pair of drugs I and J is related to uh, inputs, I and, inputs I and J and nothing else. So here's a picture of the input-output relationship in the case of four drugs. For example, the output for the pair 1-2 is connected to drugs 1 and 2, but not to drugs 3 and 4. Okay. Uh, this is a suggestion of what the, uh, the input-output relationship for matrix multiplication looks like, except it's not the complete relationship. What I have is, the, I'm assuming these are n by n square matrices, and the output element i, j, in row i, column j, depends upon the entire row i of the first matrix and the entire jth column of the second matrix. Okay. Now, again, that's not the whole input-output relationship because you have to then overlay this for every i and j. So it's a very regular but extremely dense uh, set of, of input out, uh, uh, of relating a relationship between input uh, inputs and outputs. Okay. So everybody okay with with what sort of what this I, what what a problem is in in my sense again it's relationship between inputs and outputs. Now, um, reducer size. Uh, which I'm always going to denote by a gold Q, uh, again, is the maximum number of inputs that a given reducer can handle. Okay, so it's, it's, a length, it's, it's an upper bound on the length of the value list. Now, why might I want a, an upper bound? Well, um, one sort of thing is I, I'd really like whatever the reducer is doing, I'd like it to be able to do it in main memory. So that may require that it not get too much input. Okay, so it's, I don't want, I, I want Q to be sufficiently small that the reducer can operate in main memory. Um, on, on the other hand, some, that often isn't the very significant restriction. Often I want to make Q low just to force there to be lots of reducers and therefore have lots of opportunity for parallelism. So I, I might make Q much lower than the maximum amount of input that, I, that a, one reducer could handle in main memory. Uh, uh, the other parameter then is, is the replication rate, which is the average number of key value pairs created by a mapper. Okay, and I'm going to denote that by a blue R. And it, it, it is the communication per input. Okay. Um, all right, so let, 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 me, let, me just finish, let me just do an example, then, then we'll, I think we better take a break. Uh, okay, so here's the drug interaction problem again, but now I'm going to generalize it. There are D drugs, D again, D was 3,000. G is, is the number of groups. In one case, I used 30 groups. The previous time, I used 3,000 groups with one, at one per group. Um, now, a, re a reducer needs two groups. Right, if you think of the generalization of the algorithm I described. Uh, so Q has to be big enough. It, it's got to be equal to 2D divided by G. Okay, D over G is, of course, the number of inputs in a group, or the, the number of dr uh, drug records in a group. Um, and since, I, since the reducer has to take two of those groups, uh, it, it needs 2D over G. Now, if, if you think of, again about the generalization of the algorithm, each input is going to be sent to G minus one reducers, the reducers whose keys correspond to the group of that input and one of the other groups. Well, uh, just to make life simple, uh, I'm going to say the re replication rate is actually G minus one. I'm just going to call it G, assuming G is, is reasonably large anyway, so it doesn't matter. Now, the, the interesting thing is, if I say R is G, 
then I can substitute R, replace this G by R, and now I have a relationship between Q and R that doesn't depend upon G. So I get, um, well, I, I like to write it as R in terms of Q, because Q I have control over, I can pick my Q as I like, um, and that forces the replication rate. Uh, and so the, the relationship I get is that R is 2D over Q. And so this is very interesting. It says the, the bigger I make, uh, I, I make Q, that is, the, the more work I allow a reducer to handle, the less, uh, the smaller the replication rate can be. And again, remember, re replication rate is communication per input. I want that to be small. So that says make your reducers as big as possible, but no bigger, you know, presumably you don't want them to be bigger than, um, than well, uh, that's so big that they have to use uh, secondary memory. Okay. Well, I th maybe I think this is a good point to start. Is it stop? Not start. Stop. stop.